to the phone. Okay. Wait. Did I? Oh, I can edit this. Okay. So um, let me make sure everything's good. Video's off. Welcome, everyone, to Soul Labs podcast. My name is Kelly Nazat. And today we're going into the Earth realm. And my guest today is my dear friend, Kimberly Doherty. And welcome, Kimberly, to Soul Labs podcast. Thank you. This is so exciting. <laughs> I know. It's really fun. Now, just so everyone knows and it's clear, uh, Kimberly is a, a friend I've known for quite a long time. She's been a confidant and, and renaissance woman resource for me for um, way back in Seattle, where she still lives in the area. And um, uh, Kimberly has been with me through all the iterations of Solab and through all the pre-designs, uh, uh, pre-Solab. So... Uh, I chose Kimberly for the Earth realm uh, for many reasons. Um, she's a wealth of knowledge in many areas, and she has this very earthy sensibility and uh, ability to see how things come together and and resources all come together and communities building. She really is an amazing uh, person to talk to. So I'm very excited to have you here, Kimberly. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so excited so, this is finally off the ground and kicking. It's awesome. We've I know, spent a right? lot of time in the fire realm together, haven't we? <laughs> 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 and angsted out through the water realm, and now we're finally <laughs> in the earth realm. Yay! Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, those have always been areas I've personally been most comfortable with, as you know. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's always been, um, it's been easy in a sense of uh, I naturally sure. fire water person. I, I think it is easier for introverts, um, introverted people that tend to get their energy in their alone time and in their silences and in their um, internal explorations that the fire and the water tend to be where we want to live. And then as we're bringing those ideas out into the world, we have to go into the earth realms and the fire or and the air realms and those are where we meet the extroverts like the extroverts live in earth and air all the time that's that's where they love to be um, and so it's discombobulating when we're making that transition from water to earth because all of a sudden we're having to come out of our shells and onto the land and start to build those bridges and those networks into um, out of our our happy kind of flow state and also the state that um we've done our suffering in you know like <laughs> like we kind of know the depths like the depths the, the scorpionic depths like we're kind of at home there and coming out of that is is it's a new sensation you know it's the mermaid growing her legs getting <laughs> getting up uh, uh, out of the sea and onto this onto the shore and starting to make societal connections like networking connections with other people and their passions that are not necessarily ours you know it's like we, we've had our passions tempered in that water realm and we're kind of we're bringing stuff to the table now we're we're going after projects not necessarily passions but we're bringing our passion to projects and so there's this kind of like synchronicity that starts to happen in that transition time where we're finding people that that we vibe with that are doing things we're interested in. Um, I know this used to happen a lot. Of, I, I think the place that I ran into it the most was my first few years at Burning Man, where you would have a lot of artists that were out in the middle of the desert with nothing to do but entertain each other. And just going into that kind of temporary autonomous zone, there was already a high degree of active imagination going on because people were experimenting with the facades and the faces that they showed inside of this realm um, that were not necessarily anything like what they were like in the default world when they you know outside burning man and so it's kind of like walking into a big theater 
with no play to put on, you get to put on the play while you're there. And so that caused all kinds of very synchronistic things to start to occur. And in, in retrospect, like looking back on my years at Burning Man, it's like that was a really earthy realm because it, you, were, you were pitted against like the worst that the earth could do to you in a week, which was dry you out and, and douse you in dust. Um, you're literally like you were, you're baptized in dust out there. <laughs> and and um, you also start to realize that when your camp is torn apart, the worst years, when, the, when you have the worst weather out there is when you get to know your neighbors. Because in good, in good weather years, you won't know anybody in the camps around you necessarily. But in bad weather years, you need to know where everything is. Like you, all of a sudden, like somebody three tenths down has an extra sledgehammer and somebody two, <laughs> two, two tenths beyond that has extra bailing wire. And pretty soon you're rebuilding your camp. And it's all because of the test that the earth has put you through in that realm. So it's, you're, you're forced to pull all of your resources up online. I think that that's like the earth realm is the first realm that we learn to be truly resilient in community. Without that need for, to struggle to bring th something into the world, there isn't that uh, necessarily that need uh, to be right. in community. Right. We, we may, we may in team, indeed be just maintaining, like mm. it, it's, it, it may not be a hero's journey. It may be a um, social network or a communal network that we're maintaining. And it may not even be spoken. Like I, I think that as you get more toward the earth going into air, that's when you get more of the codified, um, the verbiage, the slang, the, the ways that people are used to communicating uh, get more codified in that area. But when you're first coming out, going water to earth, you don't necessarily have that. Like you're, you're just starting to form connections with people that have resources that, um, that can be used along with yours. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I certainly that's been um, one of the, exciting points of this whole journey for me with the Spirologic model and Solab. Uh, back in graduate school after I left Seattle, moved to Boston, and I'm in the midst of a clinical psychology program that was another pretty, pretty clear mismatch for me. But in terms of experience, what it did was push me into arenas like the Mind Body Institute, uh, there in Boston, and I started to, out of necessity, seek out uh, more like-minded others, which is very much a fire realm stuff, right? If first phase mm -hmm. is you're excited, second phase is you go out and try to accomplish it, but meet up against resistances and misadventures, and but then hopefully you find some guidance and support. And, you know, of course, the, the water realm is internalizing all of that and really making it yours. But there is this, uh, and, and this is a phase we're in right now in the, the uh, group on Facebook, which is uh, the final phase of water. There is this, you know, uh, and we, we see it with, uh, with ayahuasca ceremonies and all the rest. It seems culturally we're also in this um, middle phase of water, moving towards this final phase of water, moving towards the trials of owning our own shadows, owning our own shit in order to transform them so that, uh, you know, purge them in a very real sense so that we can get to that deeper wisdom, get to that deeper uh, otherworldly sort of connection, that Piscean connection. And, you know, it's interesting in the model because if you get to that point, when you get to that point, that's the point Joseph Campbell talks about uh, finding that elixir. However, he says that's only half the journey. The other half is bringing that elixir back to your people. And for a mm -hmm. lot of us, as you were saying, this is a point where um, it's easier going into the dark and scary inner worlds for um, a shamanic type. It's another thing altogether to bring it all together and, and plant that seed. And bring it out. Yeah. And bring it out. Bring it that's out. a, 
for many yeah. of us, it's a very it's unnerving. A, yeah, I mean, I think we spend a lot of time seed gathering on the inside, and then we plant those seeds, and now it, there's a risk that t that you take once that that seed is in ground that it might not germinate, um, yeah. that all sorts of things could happen to it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, that it might that it might never break ground, and th I think that that that's it's one of the frustrating portions of of bringing something into the earth realm when in your heart of hearts you know what the seed is capable of. You have protected it all the way through the waters. You get it onto dry land, and somebody steps on it. Yeah. Like, like it's super frustrating, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, no, that was, that was so dirty. Um, it's, I mean, but, <laughs> get your foot off my seed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really easy to get territorial. And I mean, I think that that's yeah. another aspect of, of Earth realms that we don't talk about a whole lot. But like, um, I don't know, you're familiar with like cave exploration, right? A bit. Like when. When, when cave explorers go down and they go down, they go, they go through the, the places that everybody has already been. They go through the places that are already mapped. And then they get to the places that nobody's ever been, that mm. nobody's ever mapped. And that's called mapping booty. It's when you get down, that's the treasure. Like your treasure is to get to add to that map. Yes. But then you also have to make it back out alive in order to share that map with other people who will also be going in. Um, and so I think that for some, to some degree, like we get used to mapping booty on the inside, but then we when we start to transition that to the outside and make that part of a project or part of a community or, um, or even have it accepted by the tribe, that that's a whole nother art form. And that art form requires a lot of communication and a lot of comparing of maps um i see this a lot where in I, I think it's there's a whole there's a whole conversation around intersectionality um that goes on in identity politics too where people are using different terms for the same thing and they're not they, they never get to the point where they can agree that yes this you know, like we're really talking about the same thing here and people get in trouble for it all the time um, I love that anyway. term, intersectionality. That's, um, I mean, mm -hmm. it, as you're describing it, it, it's it's so much the heart of one of the the sort of implicit directives of of this model is, or this concept is bringing us all together in these common areas, uh, mm -hmm. bring our differences to show something bigger, uh, more expansive. Or, or also to accept that all of us are bringing a different type of knowledge to the table. Like if I'm looking at an actual map, like if we just, if we go literal map, if I'm looking at a highway map, it may be because I'm in a car. Like mm -hmm. I'm probably not really interested in things that are not having to do with that map. Um, if I am laying say pipeline, I probably want to know where the waterways are that we're going to be harvesting from and moving it to blah, blah, blah. So that takes a hydrology map. Now, a hydrology map and a highway map look completely different, but guess what? They're talking about the exact same territory. <laughs> like, we, we are literally talking about the same territory. Now, if I'm a hiker, I want to know about elevation. You know, I want to know about, you know, how, uh, what, are the, what are the major high points in this, in this trek? How hard is it going to be? Where can I get to? Where's the campsites? Blah, blah, blah. All of this is talking about the same territory, but all of it is bringing different information. It's the, it's the elephant and, and the blind men again. It's like, but in, at some level, we have to know as the blind man, what part of the elephant am I holding? You know, am I holding the trunk or am I holding the tail? Mm -hmm. I could be. Who knows? So, I mean, to some degree, bringing that seed out and getting it planted into the ground, you're mapping booty. You're, you're like, you're sticking your flag in the ground going, I'm bringing a map to, to what I've done, where I've been, what I can add to the conversation. But you also have to be able to name 
or accept that there's going to be intersectionality with other people's maps. Now, and that, I, I feel like that's a, a, a you know, sort of a, a beautiful um, illustration of this movement that we're going through away from postmodernism towards something more integral, something more interrelated, whereas postmodernism says, do what you want to do, do it your own way, you know, find your own caves, find your own way, you know, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe you have that one, as you said, cave booty, and you and you like it, and you stay there, and don't explore any further, maybe you're not interested in any other, because this is what you found. Uh, well, I mean, then you become the hermit. I mean, then uh, you're then you're not really, you're not completing that hero's journey because you're not bringing that map back to back to the outside world. Mm-hmm. It is part, it is part of our job to ground what we're doing at some point. Like, you know, the kid, it, the perpetual student has to, has to graduate and go into the outside world at some point. Sure. Otherwise they're a perpetual student. Like it's, you have to eventually bring your gifts to the table. And how you bring those gifts to the table oftentimes defines how they're accepted. Like candy coat them a little bit, find out where they intersect with someone else. It's not the the thing that gets me with a lot of the, the online conversation that I see right now is that there's some fabulously, genuinely wonderful, awesome people out there who are shut down by how rude things are online right now. Yeah. And so there's a lot of conversations that are not happening. There's some deep conversations that need to happen badly, but they can't if there is not a commonality of civility in the area, in, in whatever little nook or cranny of the internet we happen to be trying to have the conversation in. And, and I think that, um, I mean, I've noticed over the past couple of days and the whole conversations around Jordan Peterson. Um, Maps of I, <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's something to be said for how big your bullhorn is. Mm. And when someone gets in who has good ideas but is anta- antagonistic, is not the word I want, um, is challenging to a number of of people out there, they won't necessarily argue with his points. They'll argue with the size of his bullhorn. Hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It's, um, and I, and I think we're kind of going off on a tangent here because it's, but I think that like there are, he, I feel like he's kind of a pendulum swing away from where things were going. Like they, there, there's a level of identity politics that says my map is the only map that matters because it's mine. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem because we all share the earth. And if it, and if it comes down to, this is my map, then we're, that's a threat of violence basically it says this is my you know this is my cave stay out of it <laughs> you can't share <laughs> yeah yeah um, or I don't and, I, it. and i think that's the biggest fear especially when we're in we're we're kind of living in this duality between the the digital realm and the and the real world where we're mapping booty all the time in the virtual world because nobody's got their head around the internet completely and the internet is always changing. So now you're trying to map an ever changing space and then bring it back and apply it to the real world. Now that, that matches also with uh, my experience going into the inner worlds starting mm-hmm. you know, more than 30 years ago um, when I finally uh, found myself in the uh, quote unquote inner worlds and I could meet with my guide. I could meet with archetypes. It was a, it was definitely a very lucid state of connection. Um, having that access was just the beginning. The next part was simply put, uh, finding a way to navigate through 
of the center terrain. Uh, access is one thing, knowing how to navigate and what to do inside once you're in there is uh, another level of experience that um, you know begs for uh, some form of ability to map, to, uh, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. triangulate or to be able to um, track where you are in any given situation. Mm -hmm because it is a very fluid place. It is, and, and I believe that, um, I find it fascinating, this, this can be a little bit of, a, of another tangent, but I find it fascinating that there, there are cultures where they map where they are in space linguistically by the cardinal, cardinal directions. And we don't do that. Like, English does not have that. And Philip Zimbardo has been really cool about um, his, his observations on time and language. So, like, there, there's languages that are spatially, um, spatially directed. There are portions of our language that are very specifically time-locked. Um, and languages that don't have that time lock that they don't have like a future perfect tense they don't like nothing is ever actually done like finished in that language um can you give an example so, uh so he has a really actually a really good one in his uh in his time talk about sicilian he so he's sicilian by birth and he's mm -hmm. he's back in in italy and he's talking about the differences between northern and southern italy that like northern italy had had the history that was more Protestant and the Southern had the more Catholic and the in Sicilian, there's like not an urgency of time. Like there it's, you know, it's all going to kind of get done on its own, on its own rhythm. And then in the North, it's like, I'll meet you Saturday at 10 o'clock. I expect you to be there, you know, and they get a lot more done, right? Because they're all living by the same clock. And um, so he's, he's giving this, this lecture down there and he has a Sicilian poet that comes up to him afterwards and says, you do realize that like Sicilian has no future perfect tense. <laughs> like nothing is ever, uh, you know, like it will be done. <laughs> that, that does, like that concept. You can't translate that directly into, into their dialect in Sicilian, uh, which I find fascinating. It's like, so, so, I mean, and I think that this happens too in, um, in how our maps, even linguistically, in when we linguistically start to talk about our maps, very oftentimes we don't have the words or the concepts in our map or in the language of our tribe to actually discuss what it is we just mapped. <laughs> well, that could be like the dark side of postmodernism, which is... Uh, <laughs> I don't have a word for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I think the, the word and the, the, the myth is uh, ba uh, babble. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I mean, I think, that that's where, I think that's where a lot of intersectionality gets, gets missed, is, mm -hmm. is like, you know, if you go back to the true, you know, like the story of Babel, that... Babel was this place where they were doing such, um, I don't know, intriguing, big, preposterous things that they uh, had the languages scrambled and that people started to kind of siphon off into their own language groups and go find their way around the earth. And I think that like, if you look at it, from an ecological standpoint, it was too many people living in one space. Like what, what it was that scrambled the languages that, that may be open to interpretation, but there were too many people ecologically living in one space on earth and therefore they needed to spread out. And that is kind of, I don't know, it, that, that storyline definitely is reflected in the Indo-European um, evolution of languages that they did kind of all source out of the Middle East and, and move around the world from there and start to, to morph. But I think that now that we're in a virtual space and a reality space, trying to live in both of those worlds, we're actually demanding a lot more of our language. 
mm-hmm. that we have to find new ways to talk about this kind of double exposure that we're that we are leading these double lives. We're we're leading double lives. Every, you know, everybody on earth that is trying to get everything done in their everyday life and then still have this meaningful virtual life of some sort that connects with other people in in a more spiritual tribe or a more a more ideological tribe. I mean, I I don't know. I remember I remember when I was younger and traveling and running into people that were from other parts of the world and sitting down and having coffee with them and or you know drinks with them and talking about what it was like it you know where they came from now i don't necessarily do that because they've probably got their head in their phone trying to find their way you know navigate around seattle or i've got my head in my phone um and we're googling this or asking siri about it and we're actually asking the virtual world to explain someone else's map. And that's not what the digital structure has been geared toward. Well, we're also Um, in there. um, It uh, it doesn't know how to parse experience yet. Does that make sense? It does. And I, you know, the human spirit is uh, a phenomenal uh, um, entity experience all its own where, uh, you know, where someone might, you might see their head down and look like a bumbling tourist when in fact they may be Skyping with somebody, they may be texting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a friend, a friend in Jamaica saying, Hey, you've been to Rome. I don't know my way around. (laughs) Um, where is that cafe? I mean, there, there's the other side of it as well, that even though we're opening into this brave new world, that that could certainly limit us and confine us to these automated processes and direct us all you know along uh, the same wave path pathway through people's uh, small neighborhoods um there's mm-hmm. the other side of it as well that um if we understand how to navigate well we can use these mapping systems as a, a form of suggestion not a form of command sure yeah, I mean, <laughs> GPS, do not ever trust GPS all the time. <laughs> you will end up dead. <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we uh, learn to navigate the other worlds. We, we learn to navigate our own ambitions and, and ideals and the rest to get to this place of trying to ground our experience into something um, condensed and well-formed and uh, at least to the point where we have a good sense of why we're here. I think, you know, well, we talk about the water realm is really being all about beliefs and, and meaning and why are you doing what you're doing or why is it that you want to do what you want to do? Um, the earth realm, though, is more about how are you going to make that happen? How, how is this going to come into fruition? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the earth realm, um, it's your first commitment to resilience. It, when you step, it, it's it's that moment at which you burn the boats and you start building the bridges. I mean, that that's really that, that's the transition point from water to earth for me is that like, you're not trying to go home anymore. It's mm. time to burn the boats and it's time to start building those networks and relationships and allowing synchronicity to do its job and taking the guidance from the inner realms and putting it into practice on, on the, on the earth or, or in, in the projects that you have been called to, or in the, in the families, you know, the soul families that you have found that, the, that this is where there is a time at which we have to build community rather than it, it's the point at which we become immigrants and not migrants. That, that we, we're not trying to go back to the fire realm and the, and the water realms. We're committed. We're going to do this. Nose down. Let's go. And then yeah. that's when you start to take on the languages and the maps of where you're at. Like you, you get a true sense of place in the earth realms that you don't necessarily have in the water realms. You know, the water realms, you're floating around. You're kind of, you're being carried by the 
wind and you're in the flow and you're either at the mercy of the elements of the water or you're swimming through them. Um, but once you get on land, like you're kind of, you're kind of locked into a, a less, uh, a less 4D. Let's see, how, do, how would I put that? Um, you're going to be sharing a single plane with a lot of people for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, yeah. it's when, it's when you start to realize that like the world is not your oyster and um, it's, it's time to do, it's time to do hard work. It is. It's, I mean, for, for and this, you know, this is coming from an, an, an introvert's perspective that I think being in the earth realm is difficult for me. It's, it's one of the places I have to work hardest is in the earth realm. Well, it's great um, to have a vision. I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, my ancestors came here from the Canary Islands. They came here from the south of France and uh, back in the 1700s. And um, they were embarking on an unknown, uh, an adventure, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. desire to build a new government, a new world. Um, but, you know, being on the open oceans is its own um, adventure, but getting to this new world and then actually making a world in the midst of that um, uh, seeming wilderness, and most often it is. Yeah, and and you also you also start to go into the cycles of what is in the place that you are now going into. I, I find the Earth realm a lot more cyclical, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as like. There are seasons and times and things that happen it's in the earth realm that that's not buffered by the, just the sheer like um, mass of the water. There's a lot of space in water. Like if you get hmm. cold or hot, you just change elevation in the water. Get closer or further from the sun, and like the 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 sheer amount of water around you is going to to fluctuate that temperature. I'm I'm talking this is like really realistically, but I mean. You can go shallow or deep in water, and even in the water realms, you can go shallow or deep. You know, you go shallow, you're up toward the sun, you're in with your family, you're in that nurturing realm of water. You go deep, that's where you get cold, that's where it's hard. It's, you know, you're, you're down in the shamanic realms, and then who, who knows what's going to come out and get you. Um, but you have more variability in, in the vertical and I would say when you get to Earth, that's when you get to start playing with the horizontal because you're going to be on the horizontal for a while. Yeah, and then um, things, things are coming together. And, and, things, and, things, and you're depending on a cyclicalness on the horizontal that you don't necessarily uh, look for in the water realms. I, I, yeah. That's probably... <laughs> yeah, they're, they're definitely... There. <laughs> no, I... I, I <laughs> well, you're coming, you're getting out of the water realm and you're bringing that with you. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I like the, you know, there is this nature to it. And I think it's very fitting because there is a lot of bewilderment. I mean, uh, first you got to get your sea legs about you to be able to navigate. Then you have to really kind of seep into it as, as you lose um, all, all sight of land and you attune to um, the liquidity of water and um, the mercurial nature of water. And, um, mm -hmm. and then you are invited to go deeper and deeper until uh, you become an adept and you become kind of Neptunian in that sense where you're, you feel right at home in these inner deep emotional connections with Gaian and wisdom and this, this mm -hmm. real kind of connection with all the all, um, you know, and that's kind of like the, you know, the caricature of the, uh, the hippie chick, you know, where it's like, I remember, I remember being in Seattle speaking of, and uh, I was <laughs> where we had lots of hippie chicks. <laughs> right? I was an undergrad in psychology and I was mm -hmm. also taking, um, uh, uh, courses in body work. I was uh, at, uh, Seattle massage school and, mm -hmm. um, one of the guys uh, in the class was, you know, the quintessential Portlandia. And um, he came in and he was so distraught because 
he's like, um, people just don't get it. You know, they're, they're like moving too fast, man, you know? And <laughs> here was the thing is um, that um, as beautiful as it was, the, the, the flow that he held, there was a lack of resonance because he was expecting um, the very earthy reality of, of streets and, and traffic lights and, and crosswalks and all the rest to bend to his, uh, fluid his will. <laughs> reality. And it just wouldn't do that. Uh, I mean, it, it, was, <laughs> it was becoming a bit of a, a Darwinian sort of. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I love the, in the model, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about as I've held it for over 20 something years now, and I'm looking at the earth and the water are both these feminine aspects of our nature. They're both sort of subterranean in the sense that they're below Mm -hmm. rise of that ego consciousness. They're sort Mm -hmm. of the foundation of us where the water is very liquid and very fluid, still very feminine and very yin yin. But the mm-hmm. earth is very yin yang in a sense that it's yin holding, but it's yang in a sense that it's it it that is a springboard that gives birth to all of uh, all of life. Oh, absolutely! It's also the springboard that gives birth to a kind of complexity that doesn't. I'm not going to say it doesn't exist at all in the oceans. It's very, very different. Um, so, it, we're going to go off on another little tangent here. In permaculture, um, there is there's a concept of having animals on the landscape for a reason. Um, one of the things that we're kind of getting away from in modern farming is we're pulling animals onto one section of land and then we're trying to farm on another section of land purely plants so when you take those two 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 kingdoms away from one another all of the other kingdoms suffer because there's a certain amount of complexity that is built into life on especially on land because like water water will move a lot of stuff around like you don't have to have you don't you're going to have animals in water, but a lot of the tropisms within the ocean and the ways that plants are fed, they're fed by the water. Whereas in on earth, that gets more complicated. So it's like you have to have the fertilizers from the animals in order to keep the land fertile. You also have to have the fungi, the bacteria, the... All of the other kingdoms have to exist on Earth. In water, there's a little more, uh, there's a more chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, how do I how do I put this? Different type of cross pollination. Yeah, I mean, it like because of, because of the existence of the water, it changes. I mean, this sounds really trite, but um, it changes the nature of how nutrients move. Yeah. Whereas on Earth, once you get to the landform, you don't necessarily have anything there that can pull sunlight in and create carbs off of it or sugars for other things to survive on. Like sunlight hitting raw desert is not going to create sugar. You have to have a plant there in between. Hmm. And that plant requires all these other things to to survive. Um, if sunlight hits water, it's probably going to have that heat absorbed and moved around. It'll it'll at least cause um, currents within the water, um, kind of like you would get in the air realm. You get lots of convection in the air realm from sun, but you don't get that in the earth. And so the earth has to be moved by like eonically or tectonic plates, but um, it has to be moved by life. You know, it's the seed emerging that changes the earth. Mm -hmm. It's the animal migrating that changes the earth. It's the, it's, it's the activity of life that terraforms 
earth. Water is not like that. Water, water contains, and air to some degree contains, but earth has to be moved by life. And so our maps are constantly changing, whether we like it or not, because life is constantly changing earth. Now, when we look at that in terms of, you know, this concept of uh, these three phases of earth, these alchemical phase shifts, as is illustrated in the three houses of astrology, first phase is basically planting that seed and saying, look, um, this is my gift to the world. This is what I want to bring into the world. It's becoming clear on um, who you are, uh, that what service you want to bring to the world beyond just uh, tripping about. And the second realm is actually bringing those resources, doing the work of gathering those resources to support that mission. The final phase being perfecting that form, perfecting your medicine. Where does, how does that fit in, in terms of, as, I, as you're saying it, I, the image I had was of mycelial outgrowth, this, this nature of mm -hmm. uh, mushrooms and the rest to, to create this, this underlevel intranet or intranet of, of earth to make these connections available to the individual uh, desires of the individual plants. When we look at it from a perspective of, let's say, um, a healer coming in, having trained, uh, they, they're very fired up, they know what they want, they've gone through all that, they've definitely gone through all the inner trials, and they, they're ready to come back to society and, um, and bring their medicine to the world. Uh, how how would you see that fitting in with that motif, that sort of situation? Um, interesting that you bring up fungi, because fungi are really interesting beings. Um, they link things. They build they build bridges on the microscopic level, and. It is a truism looking back through the history of all life on earth that anything that interfaced with fungi would survive a catastrophe. Hmm. That, that the survivors of all catastrophe always made friends with fungi. And if you look at what fungi does, it takes very minute, very small steps all the time. And it's constantly talking to all the other plants and the other trees. And what it is, is an interface. It, it moves literally molecules needed on one side of the forest floor to the other side of the forest floor to, f to feed like the sugars from one tree to the roots of a plant of another. And I really feel like when we're coming out of that water realm, the very first place we're asked to hold is just as a channel. Because that's what fungi is doing. Fungi is acting as a nutrient channel from one thing to another, from one very different type of being that speaks a different kind of language to another type of being that speaks another kind of language. So we act as interpreters of the realms by being that channel for we're creating space. We're creating space for the nutrients to come through in our medicine. Does that make sense? It does. Um, and you know, and I, it's interesting as you say that. I, I, um, I recognize you as a, as a mycelial being for me in the sense that um, you have been this um, uh, incredible resource on all levels. It's not just um, uh, for, you know, ideas around technology, which is you definitely have a, a lot of insight into, but areas of, it could be into anything about interpersonal dynamics. Um, those, and it, it definitely really relates to uh, the shamanic sensibilities where you're walking that interstitial space between all of these fields where you become a bit of a, a, a all in wonder diplomat where you see everyone in the tribe cross talking. Therefore you can help each cell within that tribe work with every other cell in a way that is 
you know, creates a, a healthy body. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there's some, it's moving more than molecules, isn't it? It's moving. Well, connect- it's, it's, fi- it's finding the right space and time for something to come through. Mm. Um, not imposing our own will on it because you can't force, I mean, you can have your maps, but people don't necessarily need them all the time. No. Um, and, and it's the knowledge that when you find the person that needs the type of map you have, then great. Let's help, you know, let's help them find that. Um, but that's not, that's not a good way to explain it. Um, It's it's becoming at home in the space between Kairos and Kronos. It's be it's it's finding that appropriate time in chronological walking across the earth movement to bring your medicine in. Because so your medicine, that, like, you are your medicine. Like, your the medicine is you. So if and, we were talking and, about Kairos and Kronos, you would, I, I would see Water Realm being more of the Kairos uh, experience as opposed to uh, the Earth Realm being more um, involved. Kind of, but Ky- Kairos is bigger than that. Kairos is time outside of time. Mm-hmm. Kairos is where the gods live. Kairos mm-hmm. is is mythological realms. Kairos is Kairos is the space that is most often inhabited by love, because love is the only thing that can cross that Kairos Kronos breach easily without killing whatever it's 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 inhabiting. Now, from my understanding, that is the final phase of water, which is entering those otherworldly realms of the interstitial space connected to the uh, more than the worlds between the the space out of uh, time uh, that there is this um, this sort of uh, there's, oh there's definitely a lot of kairos in in the scorpionic realms absolutely mm-hmm. and the yeah. neptune i mean that's yeah i mean that's that's where the monsters come from but, um, <laughs> that's all you know great yeah. water um yeah, that's so Kronos, describe the difference uh, from your perspective of Kairos and Kronos. Uh, because if we're looking at the Earth realm about becoming more Kronos, you know, it's saying, okay, speed up before you get hit by that car, you know. There's a- um, yeah, Kronos is, Kronos is when your biography is becoming your biology. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way I can put it. So when you start to it's, embody your experience? You're, you're embodying... Yeah, I mean, your experience is starting to define your life. Your you, the it, it's the plasticity of the body is is starting to respond to the the biography of of how you're using your energy and and where your energy is going every day. You know, it's 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 you know your inability to forgive your mother that's draining twenty percent of your battery every day. That's you know headed back into time. Um, that becomes a chronological use of energy. It's like your bank account. It's it's like it's like a running bank account. Um, Kairos is just like this influx of you know it's it's winning the lottery. It's like how it, it, it's this sudden cash injection or this sudden energy injection into your biography and thus your biology that can burn you if there's not someone there to mitigate it. And that's where I see the interface for healers and good medicine to be is to, to help slow that energy down and get it into a vibration that is not going to hurt the person that you are helping. Does that make sense? It does. Um, Yeah. It's offering, you know, each of these elements, I, what I love about it, and, and, and as what I'm hearing as you're talking about it, what I love about these elements is they come to life. 
they come to life not just as a, a chemical reaction or a chemical response to everything else and the other elements and the rest. They actually are in themselves in this work and intelligence. So the intelligence mm -hmm. of water wants to draw you in to the deep inner worlds by first drawing you into that state of emotional comfort, wanting you to feel nurtured and at home. But that's all to get you to go through this death rebirth cycle so that you can <laughs> tap into something. Deeper. It's all a big trick. <laughs> well, yes, it is. Because it's a it, newer. Knows, it knows you're not going to go through that gauntlet um, uh, unprovoked by something sweet and lovely. Now, sure. uh, Fire Realm has its version too. The Fire Realm says, hey, man, let's get fired up and bring this out into the world, knowing fully that you're an impure vessel for this uh, venture. And um, you're going to find yourself mm -hmm. burned by, uh, by your enthusiasm and by the responses or whatever it is. But, but the, the end goal of fire is to have you purified in the spiritual way. Now, mm -hmm. the earth realm then as a being, earth mother, if you will, um, says, let's get it together and, and be appropriate, be um, tune into what you're here for. Why did, what is your elixir? What are you bringing to the world? And mm -hmm. let's see if we can't um, get you, you know, uh, sort of grounded and rooted so that um, you provide something wonderful to the world. Now, yeah, the, it's, it's, fi it's finding the appropriate space for you to do your work. It's, it's like, kudzu vine taking over most of the southern forests you know you don't want to be the kudzu vine you don't want to be you, you and, and your ego will tell you that you can be like your ego would love to be the kudzu vine <laughs> take over and just you know parasitize everything underneath but the the earth won't let you do that the earth the earth will take it, it is a great absorber of energy. Um, I mean, I, I know the times I need to feel grounded are the times I need to go to the redwoods because mm -hmm. that is, that's the biggest earth energy, living earth energy I've ever experienced that just like if I have grief, if I have if big stuff goes there and just sinks and wow. it just goes, it, it just dives and those trees just tear it apart and use it. It's fabulous because they know how, because they've been doing it for thousands, you know, thousands of years. What is the medicine? Um, what is the, in, in terms of that, what is it? What is the uh, medicine? What is the results that it leaves you? You go in um, all discombobulated and, and stress maybe, and you enter into this force grounding, releasing. What is the transformation and what is the outcome that you experience? Um, in that particular mm -hmm. forest, if I have, if I have, if I have shit on the table, um, <laughs> it turns it into, it turns it into fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It's like an, ins it's, it's an instant, um, transmutation of garbage in my life into fertilizer that I can use. And how do you experience that? Um, you're out there, you're feeling that shift happen, and there's something mercurial happening there, right? There's something mycelial or interstitial happening. There, there is. There, there's, it's one of the few places. So one of the reasons that I don't do body work anymore was because I was pulling a lot of energy from my head to my solar plexus and out into the client that I was working on person that I was working with. And I couldn't ground it down through my feet and it would make me ill. It would make me sick. Yeah. And I found that when I went to the trees and when I went to the deep forest, like the, it, it had to have a solid, like, you know, those really thick, duffy mats that happen in forests that like they're they're almost spongy because they're so it's so dense with like a million years worth of tree litter and bacterium and everything is there and it's a soft forest floor because of that but it t it's like that kind of mat would allow the energy to go ahead and ground and get out of my body 
Uh-huh. And it was, and it was very different from like, from day to day, like I could do the, the, you know, the hot bath with the uh, Epsom salt and um, help me out. Um, apple cider vinegar. Mm-hmm. Um, you create like a, a pretty light battery basically. And that, and that would help rebalance the energy, but it, I couldn't get rid of that like toxic energy that I was helping people get rid of. It was getting lodged in my body until I would go out to the forest and like, just let it because part of my ego, I think it was wrapped around trying to fix this person. And, and because I was doing that, I was holding that toxic energy. So it was, there. it was, it was for me, um, the age and the mass of the forest and its complexity was able to generate a medicine that I could not get in, you know, the city. Yeah. And so you leave the forest and you feel you experience reality. I leave the forest with a much bigger sense of time. A bigger sense of time. A much bigger sense of time. And that bigger sense of time creates enough space for me to keep working. I remember doing years ago uh, a vision cry with uh, when I was in the Northwest. Uh, and we'd been training for this for over a year. And uh, it was five days out in the this sacred canyon. And I remember the admonition of the medicine man I worked with said, uh, you know, he says, your, your main task is to simply be present. Don't reflect in the past or project into the future. Just be with what's there and not sleeping and just being present, not, not being connected with a schedule or any of that stuff. It became more and more clear that just being present was informing me that watching the eagles fly out of the the tree for the day and then come back and completing this day night cycle and the the wind sweeping in in the evening and the and the sun slowly rising and all of these things by the end of it i had a very t- challenging time coming back into my four walls you know and ceilings mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and I had this more, I realized at that point that the mind that was awakening was not the mind that I use in my daily life, that it was a bigger, something, a bigger time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It it is. um, It's an extension. It's, it's where active imagination plays. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's the burning man of nature. Huh. Um, like it, this, and that is actually something that happens to people that go to Burning Man too. Um, they have a real hard time integrating when you come back out. Um, it's called, oh, I forget what it, they have a slang term for it, but it's um, basically being dis, disenchanted um, with the four walls because it's not, it's just not conducive to active imagination and attention because there's not once you get the four walls around you you're in a contained conditioned area like your body is going to be held at like 60 to 70 maybe 80 degrees there's not going to be seasons in the inside of four walls there's not going to be plant movement and animal movement unless you control it um there's just, there's a lot of stuff that's not going on inside of four walls. So it feels safe because it is, you know, bodily, you're going to be fine. But active imagination wise, it's not. I mean, you're not going to go sore with an eagle because there's not an eagle in your living room, you know? <laughs> yeah. Whereas, where, whereas you can actively, imaginatively project yourself into the shape of an eagle or a jaguar or you know, like the shaman were doing and still do the journey work that they do because they have access to the outdoors, you know, because they have access to that, just a million different languages of life going on simultaneously on earth. And that, I mean, like that's the, it, I think of, I think of like the transition between desert floor and jungle 
on earth as being ha the difference between the individual and a functional, beautiful working society. Like in a jungle, when that sunlight hits the top of that jungle canopy, it could be years before the, ca the calorie that goes into that plant cycles its way through a million other plants and animals and down into the fungi and then gets shipped to another tree. Um, it's j it, there's so much complexity and so much room for life in that jungle that you don't have on the desert floor. And I, and I think like the leveling of humanity and of our, of large portions of our earth, those go hand in hand. Like we're, we level the psyche by making everybody a consumer of a brand or, you know, creating lack in, in the outside world to, mono, to, to monetize. Um, that when you look in nature doesn't exist because nature has so many complexities and that one, one sequence, you know, the, the garbage of one sequence is becoming the food of another sequence that is, is constantly churning and moving and changing. And that's where the active imagination can go crazy haywire. Awesome. You know, like that, there's a reason that plant medicines exist in very complex um, natural societies, I believe. I believe. That's my personal belief. Because, um, you know, you get to like the, the desert fathers and the, the, the mystics going up into the caves, like not a lot of play there. Um, they're definitely, their interior journeys are very different. They're yeah. really, really different. The medicine that they bring, very different. Well, it's interesting, this, this call towards this um, awareness of the expansiveness that brings us back to that expansive mind big time and all the rest also begs for um, its balance in systems and processing. Mm -hmm. And very defined. I mean, we see it in every culture, right? Mandalas, medicine wheels. We see everything coming into harmony because there is this registering of these cyclical patterns that seem to coordinate with each other, these alchemical processes that one follows the next that have these elemental analogs. And we map those things. And the more we can you know, move on with them, the more refined and simple they become. And in a certain sense is a reason why most of this wisdom, this knowledge has been lost to our culture, because we have, we are now in the wilderness of technological expansion. And we're trying to find our way in that. Um, not really, as you were saying earlier in our talk, not really yet being able to map it out. How do we find this place in that. I, I mean, even with Facebook, right, we have this, uh, you know, the sharing of memes and this very postmodern sort of like exaltation, uh, if you want to call it that. And, you know, one of the ideas with this group was, what would it be like to have weekly um, uh, sort of focuses? What would it be like in this environment to create a process, a 13-week movement? Now, it's not anything about the movement necessarily, but it's about taking a sort of a, a, a witnessing or a sort of a, a conscious a stance with this uh, complexity. And what does that do to our experience when we start to impose order on top of the chaos of our natural lives. What is what does nature offer in that sense? In this, you know, nature provides uh, wood to build homes. It provides all these things to create structure. And in fact, you know, animals live in caves. They they live in the roots. They, you know, nature does provide, even as it also provides this complexity. Absolutely. How, how is it? Uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, something uh, that you're well versed in with, uh, with um, uh, help me, um, the, <laughs> what is the name of um, the, you were just talking about earlier with the uh, farming and nature and 
Oh, permaculture. Mm-hmm. With permaculture, thank you. Mm-hmm. With permaculture, they have uh, developed all sorts of concepts and theories and systems about how to, uh, it seems that something we do, right, is need to impose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yes. Per- permaculture is it, is interesting because it's it's a it's a design format that's bringing in a whole lot of different technologies from indigenous cultures. So I mean, it's it's very I, there's there's a level of it that's very politically incorrect just because it's not acknowledging how much of the knowledge it's bringing in is is really historically from indigenous peoples that have been out there. They've sat there and watched the eagle fly and noticed this about nature and gone on to create a technology that allows that to happen within a built environment. Um, it's, it is, a, and, and yeah. <laughs> I, I got to not go on a fun tangent on that one. Um, permaculture is great as a design theory. It is, it's really phenomenal as a design theory. It also incorporates some of the ideas about how much a system can handle um, the, the limits of systems mm-hmm. and uh, especially the limits of human systems. There's a, one of the best, I mean, to some degree, what permaculture gave me was a really good reading list um, to go out and read of people that were not in permaculture because they were all systems theorists and they were map makers of, of their own persuasions. And one of the best books I ever, ever read on systems was by a woman named Danella Meadows. And she wrote a book called Thinking in Systems. And that completely changed. That was as mind-bendingly awesome for me as like Carolyn Mace's Anatomy of the Spirit. Like it, it was that kind of like a paradigm shift for me um, to realize that there are levels and levers and places that you can affect huge systems very simply. And I believe to some degree that's what healers do and that's what our medicine is is to find the place that we leverage the system for the good of all. That's it. That we don't, you know, that we don't have to be out there with a bullhorn or trolling everybody on the internet. We find our place where our medicine is leveraging a system for the good of all. Now that's a difference between the earth realm and the air realm. The air realm Mm -hmm much more essentializing uh, mental, it's, it's cognitive, it's, it's communications, it's talking it through, it's being intellectual, it's all of those academic exercises that is a gauntlet in itself. The earth realm says, embody it, mm-hmm. be it. Yeah, there's, there, there's, the, uh, there's an amazing um, herbalist that I absolutely love, Stephen Buhner, and he tells a story of um, how animals create get medicine from plants some some animals what they were noticing in in this particular story he was telling was there was a a species of monkey that would go and if it was not feeling well would go and look for a very specific plant and it would find multiple individuals of that plant and it would sit with them for a while and then it would keep moving and it would, and eventually it would find a, it would find one of these species of plants, and it would take the leaf from that plant and hold it in its mouth, and it wouldn't eat it; it would just hold it. And then it would leave, and the next day it would come back and eat the plant. Now, like, what is going on here? Well, they did some, you know, scientific studies, harvested part of the plants, looked at how much of the chemical that that monkey needed in order to to be medicine um, before and after the monkey had held it in its mouth. And it turns out that overnight, the plant had amplified its production of that chemical before the monkey came back and took it as medicine. And that's how I kind of feel like 
we are in the world. Like we are that plant. When we find that entity that needs the medicine, we amplify what they need particularly. And we give it like that. We, we are, we, we're, we're the harvesting system from the other worlds to produce that medicine on an as needed basis. Does, now, does that mean that, that the plant should take over the entire forest? No. <laughs> it will hold its space in the forest where it, it is until it's needed. Uh, and, and everyone has their own type of medicine that is needed in the world. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like there's a connection there with the idea of the insights into um, mirror neurons and that empathy gene that we have, mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. connection with other that um, can't be denied. I, I wonder if there is some of that going on with a plant uh, tuning into um, the, the resonant energy of that monkey and then um, in a sense, taking on, you know, from the shamanic perspective, you resonate with the other, and, and especially in the dis-ease, and you hold that in your own being as an experience, and you do the work of transforming it into a medicine. It comes mm -hmm. as a poison, and mm -hmm. whatever that work you do to recalibrate it into something considered medicine, that's what you can offer back. But there is this period of intake, this period of ingestion, this period of, of, of incorporating and transmuting, transforming it into something that mm -hmm. is sort of more than just us. Yeah. I mean, on, on a purely chemical level with the plants, it's, it could be, um, there, there is something that plants do when they're being attacked by a bacteria or a fungi that is, um, that's not a, it's a, where it went. The paras a paras parasitizing fungi and uh, deleterious bacterium, let's put it that way, uh, microbes that are not good for it, um, mm -hmm. it will start to produce more of a chemical that will repel that. So it's creating its own medicine. Could be that the monkey is introducing that bacterium or fungi to the plant and that the plant is taking it in. And, 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 and in that sense, like, it, um, transmuting the shadow or you know it's it transmuting the into medicine for that monkey the, the monkey will be the beneficiary of it eventually but that is a, it is a it is a system in within the plant to try and ward off that particular bacterium or or fungi so i mean i it's it is i think it speaks to the inner the interdependence of all things like we, we, we've spent a lot of time as a culture going from dependence to independence, but we haven't spent a lot of time as a culture going from independence to interdependence. And I think that that's where we learn from the natural and especially the earth realms where we can observe the interdependence on a regular basis of nature in its, in its most functional forms that like, yeah, we're supposed to be interdependent with A, each other, B, the other realms, and C, the natural world. Yeah. All they of all the above. Know. They're all teaching us how to be mm -hmm. connected and how to hold that field. It's interesting that Martin Buber, Martin Buber post, uh, post his uh, quote that says... Uh, I love his Twitter feed, don't you? <laughs> he's on fire. He's on fire. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love it. it. And it came out just so ordinarily, you know. <laughs> his post where he said, God's more between us than within us. And mm, I think mm -hmm. um, you have Grant Maxwell's uh, new book called Dynamics of Transformation, where he also is looking at what, what are we coming into now? What are we mm -hmm. moving out of this? What's beyond postmodernism? Everyone just doing their own little uh, weekend workshops or doing this or doing that and doing their own thing. Um, we really are coming to this space of connection, this mycelial type of, of reunion. Um, and that's, you know, that's the exploration we're looking at with this earth realm stuff is how do we ground that? We, we talked about mm -hmm. the complexities. Mm -hmm. We talked about the challenges. 
Um, you talked about the impo- imposition of systems and the rest to, to be able to, to, to map our way through this. Um, there is this real sense of we're learning how to, um, to ground this and, and to, uh, to germinate something new, to, uh, to create something well-formed that becomes a new way in the world. We, we're in desperate need of, of Oh, absolutely. New- Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's some of it is is remembering how we have been in the world before and bringing that into the modern day and the new landscape that we have created, uh, you know, either consciously or unconsciously, we have changed the world like be just being human on the planet. We have changed the world and the healing of both the natural systems and of each other has to go hand in hand. Like we're not going to do one without the other. No. So our, our medicine is both toward the earth and for the earth and for each other and to each other. Yeah, definitely. Now that, you're, that's, you know. you're talking to me from your uh, cryotherapy lab. Uh, <laughs> my, bio, my biohacking lab. Yes. <laughs> It is biohacking at its best, and I, I love it. Um, you're, you're, you know, you've gone through the gauntlet of, of explorations in all these areas, and yet you have found um, part of your medicine, at the very least, in doing cryotherapy, uh, offering this, um, this treatment to the physical body. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and what I... One of the reasons I chose to bring this this particular modality here was a, you know, nobody brought it yet, but also because it didn't depend on a lot of pharmacology. It depended on uh, basically forcing the body to remember what it already knows how to do. Because one of the things that the body does when it goes into a hypothermic reaction is it's, it remembers how to heal very fast very fast. So the wisdom is there. The wisdom of the body is there. We have overloaded it with so much cortisol and adrenaline because Mm. of how we live that we often, like the body has a tendency to create what are called inflammatory markers. It's a technical term, interleukin cytokines. Um, They're they're proteins that the body uses to communicate with itself and and tell what parts of the body to, oh, um, say we need to inflame this muscle because you have to realize inflammation has has a purpose. Like in the body, inflammation is how the the body holds something in stasis um, and says, you know, I don't have the time or the energy or the nutrients to fix this right now. So we're just going to put it in this natural cast called inflammation and we're going to hold it there until we can get around to it. It's the body's way of putting things on the back burner. Well, one of the things that happens in a hypothermic reaction during that internal blood cycle is the body says, Hey, you know what? Everything we've had on the back burner, we got to get to that right now. Like all hands on deck. So it dumps a bunch of healing hormones into the body. It pulls all the nutrients it can into the, into the blood and pulls a bunch of oxygen into the blood too. So it hyperoxygenates the blood. And so when you get out, not only are the inflammatory markers filtered out temporarily, um, the body can actually get into all of these spaces that it hasn't been able to get into before because of the inflammation. But now it also has this super rich healing blood um, going in there. All of this is done without pharmacopoeia. This is strictly tricking your, bro- your body into healing itself more rapidly than it normally would by, ch- by, um, by triggering a survival instinct in the lizard brain. Seriously. Sounds very shamanic. It, it, it's, it's awesome. It, it, it's, <laughs> so, it's so awesome. Um, mostly because it works so simply. It's such a simple solution to a complicated problem. Like, otherwise, I'd have to give, you know, it, people would be taking opioids to, to deal with the pain from the inflammation, and then their body would be reacting to that, and that would be causing, you know, anything from constipation to inability to, to function um, just from the opioids. 
So it's like you can, you can do things that you would have to have pharmacopoeia to deal with just by triggering the instruction manual that your body already has on how to heal this. I think that's beautiful. The other thing that we're learning about it now is that in that hypothermic condition, it also uh, regenerates a lot of the nervous system. It, it, well, I shouldn't say that. It creates a protein um, called RBM3 that um, we see a lot of in the neurology of bears coming out of hibernation. So when a bear is coming out of hibernation, it's had uh, its its neurology has has had some um, some latent shrinkage, and those neurons are rejuvenated and grow back out with this RBM three. So it turns out that that RBM three may indeed be why cryotherapy is so effective with MS. So it can put MS into remission just because it's helping the body, it's stimulating the body to regenerate the nerves faster than the disease can break them down. It won't cure MS because that it still exists in the body, but you can get to a better stasis. You can keep the body in, in a place, or not stasis, let's make it. it. It will start to reach a balance between um, the building up and the tearing down of the nervous system. And I think that that's... It, that kind of goes back to the earth realm because the earth realm is this, it's, it's regenerative in a way. Um, we have to accept that there's going to be tearing down and the resilience to keep building on the other end of it. Um, so, I mean, mm -hmm. part, there's, there's kind of a poetic part of cryotherapy that I love too, because it doesn't cure anything it helps the body fix itself, but it does it in and of itself, just that kind of amazing cold does not cure the body of anything, but it does lots of really cool things. <laughs> <laughs> and for everything else, there's biohacking. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that, that sort of, uh, I think in a certain way sums up much of this work is, is um, how do we, um, you know, bring all that uh, we've learned and experienced in the world, both inner worlds and outer worlds, how do we bring that all together to plant a seed, uh, a way forward to be in service to the world? And, um, you know, they say that the, the simplest solution is the most powerful, um, that, you know, this whole earth realm is about really about getting that um, formalize. I mean, even in terms of, you know, very practical issues, you had to go through a whole lot and we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a whole journey into itself. It's still, you know, that journey is still going on and probably still, will be. Well, it, and it we're, will go on. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we and are on, going to <laughs> do a deep dive. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, this week, let's say, um, uh, uh, we, we should plan it and, uh, talk a bit more. Uh, go a little bit more in depth about uh, our conversation, but um, you know that that is a big part of it. I mean, to get where you are today, um, there was a lot to it, and I and I think you know in terms of refinement and systems and all the rest of that, and certainly in terms of Solab, one of the ideas is that we really want to take the wisdom, the hard earned wisdom from my experience, from your experience, and from thousands and thousands of others who have something to say about this process of life and about bringing your medicine out into the world and holding that not in a reduction saying this is the way, but holding it in a sense saying here are the reduced ways, a sort of purified wisdom and insights into all these key areas of the process from all of these different ways of knowing, these different ways of mm -hmm. experiencing mm -hmm. reality. And that, you know, that is part of the conversation we'll, we'll have. How do we do that in a good way? How do we hold space? What are some of the challenges you've seen in different systems, different ways of knowing? What are some of the strengths that you see? I think it'll be a fun journey that we can go into. I know that uh, our time is up and you, you have clients coming in. But um, I think that's a, if you're willing to go a little bit deeper, I think that would be a really interesting point of um of departure for our next conversation 
how do we how do we look at what's gone before us and find the values of how to bring community together? Uh, you know, these are these are very important things. How you've seen it happen and Burning Man and permaculture and uh, you know you're working a uh, training with Carolyn Meese and all these wonderful people have insight for us and how to move forward because there are many out there who are coming through this process wanting to. Um, understand not just how to go through their own developmental process of fire and water, but also how to earth it and to air it, how to bring it out into the world. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we can definitely talk more about that. For sure. For sure. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Let's do it. <laughs> so I wanna, I, I'm going to leave you with the, the last word here. Now I want you, if you wouldn't mind just saying, uh, I'll I'll give you the topic. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, I know. I'm, I'm not going to make it terribly easy on you. Um, I I want you to um, define in your term what uh, a soul is and what is a laboratory. What is a soul lab in your terms? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, for me, soul lab is a playground. Hmm. Um, it's, I mean, I think of laboratories, I think of biohacking, I think of all the things we do on a physical, in the physical realm to take care of our own bodies on a day-to-day -day basis and try to get to, you know, peak performance of the physical body itself. But Solab is taking that back into the collective And it's the playground to play with everybody else. I love that. <laughs> and, I, and every other being out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, but and, yeah, <laughs> we'll start with us. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Thank you, Kimberly. I, I, oh. I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it is a playground. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's definite power in play and play. And play is where all good things begin. Cubs play in, in order to learn how to be in the world in a new way. And that's what we're holding space for. So um, as always, uh, I love our conversation. And I look forward to uh, going deeper. For everyone listening, we're going to uh, be uh, putting this together probably within a couple days after or so. We'll see. Uh, we'll uh, also air the deep dive that'll be available on uh, Solab's Patreon site, patreon.com slash Solab. So we'd love for you to join us there where we're adding all sorts of great insights and and um, journeys and all the rest of that and, and deeper podcast uh, interviews with wonderful people like Kimberly. So thank you all for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, join into the conversation. Uh, bring in your wisdom, uh, bring in your questions, bring in your ideas. Uh, this is a, a wonderful playground, as Kimberly says. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Kimberly, so much for this great conversation. My pleasure. We'll talk soon. Will do.